Kalima Washington is an activist, advocate, and human services professional with nearly two decades of experience working to build power for impacted communities in New York City and beyond. Thank you. Halima is also a Black mama and a doula committed to creating a world where Black mothers, children, and families can be safe, seen, and supported. As the community coordinator and leader of the Participatory Action Research Project at RISE, Halima currently leads a team of impacted parents in holding community conversations and conducting community-led research to identify and develop a vision to address root causes and offer solutions to child welfare involvement. Prior to joining RISE, Halima worked as a facilitator for the Beyond Bars Fellowship Program at Columbia University's Center for Justice. In addition to her work at RISE, Halima continues her activism efforts with the hashtag abolish ACS and hashtag defund ACS campaigns and her advocacy efforts through work as a birth justice defender. Halima is a former Columbia University Beyond the Bars Fellow and NYC Department of Health Birth Justice Defender. Let's give her a round of applause to welcome her. Christine Gottlieb is co-director of the New York University School of Law Family Defense Clinic, an interdisciplinary clinic which represents parents accused of child abuse and neglect and strives to keep families together. Chris litigates, teaches, and writes in the field of child welfare and collaborates with practitioners and government agencies to improve child welfare policy. Chris has represented hundreds of parents and children in New York City family courts. She serves on the New York City Bar Association Council on Children and the Steering Committee of the American Bar Association National Alliance for Parents Representation. She is a graduate of the University of Chicago and of New York University School of Law. She clerked for Judge Fortunato B. Benavides of the Fifth Circuit of the United States Courts of, Court of Appeals. Chris is a recipient of NYU's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Faculty Award and of the New York City Bar Association Catherine A. McDonald Award for Excellence in Service to the Family Court. Her article, Reflections on Judging Mothering, was selected as a notable essay of 2010 by the Best American Essay Series. Chris's publications also include Children's Attorney's Obligation to Turn to Parents to Assess Best Interests, Justice Denied, Delays in Resolving Child Productive Cases in New York with Marty Guggenheim, Participation in Family Court Hearings in Absence of Clients with Holly Beck, and Parity with Clarity with Dorsheen E. Leithold. Let's give uh, Chris a round of applause. So first, I'd love to start off by talking about the current state of the child welfare system or what many people call the family policing system or the family regulation system. Why is there a call for Miranda family warnings in New York? And is your mic working? My mic is not working. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, what was the question again? I'm sorry. So why is there a call for, for Miranda family warnings in New York and what's happening with the family regulation system? So there is a call for the Miranda rights because these are rights that families already have and they need to be made aware of. Because oftentimes when the family regulation system knocks on the family's door, they just come in and then start strip searching people's children for bruises. And they start to go through your cabinets and your refrigerator, looking to see if you have food and all of these things. And that's not okay. Because if a person is arrested on the street or if a person is approached on the street by an officer, they ask questions first and they're given their Miranda rights. I mean, they don't, do that as much here in New York State as they should, but we're asking for them to do it for families that are um, under investigation by the family policing system. And I'll hand it over to Chris to talk right. some is more. Mine, about it. Is mine on? Okay, yeah. so great. Um, uh, well, first, thank you, uh, 
uh, Cynthia and Caitlin for uh, for having us. Um, uh, I, I do, as, as Caitlin said, this is an issue that really has not yet gotten the, the attention it, it deserves. I, I'm not going to say it's the most important civil rights issue, but I do think it's the most important civil rights issue that no one pays attention to. Um, and uh, Halima and other um, parent activists have really started to change that just in the last couple of years to really let people know um, that there's a lot going on that's not okay. Um, and, you know, in my mind, the first step to enforcing rights and making them meaningful is, is letting people know about them. And that's what the Miranda legislation is, is all about. Um, you know, Halima described just some of the really invasive steps that um, Children's Services takes. I mean, coming into having a government official come into your home, uh, sometimes strip search your children, sometimes leave with your children. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine uh, a more um, uh, in, invasive government intervention. Um, maybe sometimes it's necessary. Um, but of course, uh, what you may already know as the, as the public dialogue around this starts to change is that the extreme cases of child abuse that led to the policies and practices we have today are an, an unbelievably small percentage um, of, of the cases. I mean, most of the families who are subject to this system, there's never even an allegation of abuse raised. It's, it's almost all neglect allegations and almost all the neglect allegations have to do with poverty. Um, and, and, a, and an enormous percentage of them are allegations of things that are happening um, in all kinds of homes, um, uh, but the government is only intervening in, in the families of black and brown uh, children. And, and it, it's just, uh, I, I think there's a growing sense that there's a time that it's time for a change uh, and that letting people know their rights is, is the very first step on that. Um, yeah, I just, first of all, I just wanted to ask um, for an overview of the family Miranda rights bill, um, but also maybe if um, one of you could just also say what triggers an investigation, because it's also like a really um, low bar uh, for people to be investigated in the first place. Well, what triggers an investigation is a call to a hotline um, by a mandated reporter or someone else who believes that a child is being abused, neglected, or maltreated. And then once that call is made, they send out investigators or ACS workers to the person's home to investigate the call that was made. Oftentimes when the person, when the investigator gets to the family's door, they, it doesn't matter what time it is, it can be the wee hours of the morning, or it can be in the middle of the day, like it doesn't matter what time the call is made, they immediately send uh, ACS workers out to the person's home to do the investigation. Or if the children, if the children are in the home to make sure that they're safe, so they say to make sure that they're safe. They come into the home, they start, they ask to see the children. They start to strip search the children, as I said, looking for wounds and anything to prove any type of abuse, maltreatment or neglect. They look into your cabinets and the refrigerators. And these are happening more often in black and brown communities than they're happening in any other communities. And oftentimes the, the children are taken for neglect or like not having any food in the cabinets and not having enough food in the cabinets. Or if you send your child to school with not uh, appropriate clothing you can be, a report can be called in on you. And if it if the worker comes to your house and they see that you have, your house is in disarray, that can be a reason for your children to be removed. Um, then after that happens, they, I mean, they, they expect, ACS workers expect to be let into the home because families are often fearful because if they're, if, the ACS worker is not let into the home, then they let the families know that they can call the police and then the police will have them escorted into the home or allow them to be in, uh, allowed entry into the home. And so oftentimes the people that are being investigated are already fearful and already under stress or already in crisis. And so with that, uh, the threat of more crisis coming in is just like, it's, it's too overwhelming and it, it, it doesn't 
make any sense and families don't know that they have the right to refuse entry into the home. They have the right to have a lawyer present or a lawyer called or contacted to support them through this process. And a lot of times, like when it happened to me, when I was investigated for uh, child abuse, it, it happened, um, my son had an asthma attack. He was in the hospital. I did not like the care that he was receiving in the hospital. I asked if he could be transferred to another hospital. Um, they told me that he couldn't be transferred to another hospital or that I would have to deal, I would have to get him transferred, which was ridiculous. Um, I asked for someone to help me get my son out of the hospital to transfer him to another hospital. They refused to support me and I had to sit there and did let the, allow them to continue to mistreat my son. I, um, what after the social worker that was dealing that was dealing with me called ACS and told them that I was trying to leave the hospital with my son against medical advice. And at the time, the hospital that I was in, um, he was the unit we were in intensive care because he was he was incubated for asthma. I don't know if folks know what an incubator is. It's when they put the tube down your throat. And so we're already in crisis mode. And so to hear, it's like uh, the wee hours of the morning. And I only find out that an ACS call was made against my family because my partner who was home at the time, my son is a twin and he has, he has a, a my, my other, child was home my other children were home and my partner was home and my partner called me alarmed while I'm in the hospital I think it was two or three o'clock in the morning to say the ACS was at the door what happened and I'm like well what do you mean ACS is at the door what happened they're asking to see the children they want to make sure that they're okay because you're trying to leave the hospital with um your other child and Fortunately for me, because I'm connected to a lot of activism and like resources in my community, I knew exactly what to do. I have lawyers on speed dial. I called my lawyer and she told me to ask for the administrator on duty. And so I called and actually the administrator on duty. And I was told that nothing could be done about the call that was made to ACS against my family because it had already been made and that if, if I don't have anything to worry about, then just let them do their investigation. And so when they're doing their investigation, they're in your life for 60 days, looking into every aspect of your life, calling your family, your friends, your, the, the children's school, anybody connected to you to ask about how you are with your children, if these allegations of abuse, maltreatment, and neglect are true. And it is probably the most embarrassing thing that can happen to a person, a black woman, especially because it's like the, the narrative around black motherhood is not very positive. And when you think about, like, even think to yourselves, when you think about black motherhood, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? And you don't have to answer here, but like those thoughts, those negative thoughts that come into your mind first about black motherhood are the thoughts that are the, the, the popular thoughts of most people when it comes to what we think about mothering on the margins or black motherhood or mothering while you're brown or in poverty or in any other um, unsavory conditions. And so when, when a family is investigated and they don't know their rights, it's just, it's opening a Pandora's box of other things that can happen to them and creating more crisis where it doesn't need to be crisis. If families know they have the right to not open their door or not respond or have a lawyer present or have a lawyer or, or have any type of resources available to them, it would be a much better outcome for these families. And it would be easier for these families to, to stay connected. Um, ACS 
or the administrate the family policing system targets, surveils, and punishes black and brown communities. We know this. They like the police do the same thing, and people oftentimes do not know what their rights are, even when dealing with the police. So if people don't know what their rights are when dealing with the police, and people don't know what their rights are when dealing with ACS, when does it stop? Like, when do people get to know what their rights are when they're dealing with systems? And it's like, for us, it's important for us to let people know that they have rights, first of all. And with that, I think I'm a little complete. I said a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, maybe just uh, tell, tell us briefly um, about the bill specifically, and then maybe we'll open it up. Caitlin, does that sound good? Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think Halima's experience shows so many of the disturbing things about this, right? That it, it's actually parenting we should be celebrating, you know, that the, the overprotective, I want a second opinion, I want what's best for my child, um, leading to uh, investigation um, is is just um, I think indicative, and we see that you know calls somebody maybe is seeking more special education services in school, or they don't, or, or fewer special education services, and then they they get a call in for that. I mean, it's it's really we just have things backward at this point. I think it's just been a kind of mission creep. Um, that was not built into the statutes. I mean, the people who wrote the, the statutes were not imagining um, the system that we have. Um, and I, I think it's only been able to creep in the way that it has because of the, the families that it's hurting. Um, and of course, it's not only hurting the parents, right? It is traumatizing the children uh, as well. Um, and so the Miranda bill itself um, simply uh, requires the caseworkers to say out loud that the rights that are already there um, and uh, when I say already there, sometimes um, legislators and others have asked me to point to, well, where in the statute does it say you have a right to this? And um, they don't know, uh, maybe as much as you all as law students already know, that that's not actually how our, our system works. That the, the statute tells a government agency the specific things it can do, um, and it can't do anything beyond those. Um, and so, uh, the person has the right to, to anything beyond what the statute has authorized. And um, our statutes in New York, I think as written, are actually pretty good. If, if they were enforced in practice, we, uh, we would live in a very different world. Um, our statutes say that when a, one of these calls come in and, and the worker comes out to your house, um, uh, they are allowed to ask you to enter your home. They're allowed to request all kinds of things in the course of their investigation, um, but they can only demand those things. They can only require those things if one of two things is the case. One is that they went to get a court order authorizing the, the intervention uh, that they're seeking, or it's an emergency circumstance. And those are exactly the two uh, categories that allow the police to come into your home. I mean, Halima just said, just think for a moment that this idea that a caseworker could go and get a police officer to come to your house and do something that everybody knows the police officer would be constitutionally forbidden from doing otherwise, right? A police officer can come into your home if, if he or she has a warrant or if there is an emergency, exigent circumstances. And so what the Miranda bill does is just lay out, say out loud that the same is true um, in, uh, in, in the child welfare context that, so it requires that a person be told both uh, verbally and given in writing in their own language, importantly, um, their rights, which include, you do not have to open the door absent a court order or emergency. Um, you do not have to be interviewed and statements you make can be used against you. You do not have to allow your children to be interviewed. You are not required to sign a HIPAA. Um, I mean, the whole idea of a, of a HIPAA is it, you're releasing information. And, and today what we have our caseworkers saying, you have to sign a HIPAA. Well, I mean, what would it even mean to have the right to confidentiality if, if you have to sign the release? So you don't have to sign a HIPAA, you don't have to take a drug test, um, uh, and that you have a right to counsel. Those are the rights that we're talking about. Nothing radical, nothing that is a change. People just need to know. 
Um, and we have uh, this, these bills are pending at both the city council level and the state level. Um, I, I think we very much need them at the state level, um, but of course, New York City is sometimes quicker to, to take progressive steps. And so we're hoping maybe the city will do it first, um, followed by the states. But, but it's as simple as that, what the, what the bill would do. Um, and I, I just wanna emphasize that I think for the, the parent activists and the advocates, um, it's only partly about telling parents their rights. It's also about telling those government officials, the caseworkers, their rights. Because you know, as, as unhappy as we may be about choices that police officers make sometimes, there is no police officer who doesn't know where the line is. They know where, where the line is, what they're, what they're allowed to do, what they're not. Sometimes they cross that line. But what we have now is a situation where caseworkers are trained um, that, that they can tell you what to do when, when it isn't legally justified. And so saying this out loud is just a way for them to know um, where, where that line is as well. Should we open it up? Yes. Or do you want to add something? Okay. Um, so questions from the audience. And I think um, because it's being recorded for people who couldn't be here, um, we can get you a mic. Do you want, you have one, Marva, or do you want to use one? Okay. Okay. <laughs> They're all at that table. <laughs> uh, is this on? Okay. okay. Thank you so much um, for this panel. Um, and for sharing your experience as well. Um, it was really powerful. Um, and so I'm curious under what circumstances uh, ACS defines emergency and how they use that um, in order to gain access to a home um, and how, if, if at all, this bill contemplates um, what are the def what's like the definition of emergency? imagining circumstances in which they might overstep. So um, really important question. Um, and of course, the, the problem right now is when you, when you ask how do they define an emergency, they don't define it now because they, they think they can do whatever they want whenever they want. They're not even considering is this an emergency circumstance before they tell a family, you have to do this, you have to do that. So right now, there's no working uh, definition. Um, the, the legislation does not spell out the definition, um, and that's on purpose. Um, uh, I mean, partly because we really do see this as a first step, and this is not a radical step. This is the very first step. Like, let's just say out loud what people's rights are. Um, I also think it would be quite challenging. I mean, this is a challenge of family regulation statutes in, in general, that it's very hard to list every possible form of uh, you know, abuse. Um, so you need a definition that has some flexibility that is that is constrained enough that it doesn't allow subjective biased decision making, um, but does allow um, us to really capture the things we're concerned about. Um, so same here, one couldn't have a, an entire list of emergencies, um, but that's true on the criminal side as well. It's through the case law that these things are developed, and you know it's it's easy to say what's on one end or another. If a caseworker hears a child screaming in an apartment, of course, that would count as the exigent circumstances that would allow them to demand entry to see that child, just like a police officer could without a warrant um, follow that kind of sound. Um, I think it's equally clear that when ACS gets a call that a child has missed some school and, oh my God, maybe it's a pandemic and, and uh, they were you know using spotty Wi-Fi and, and, and maybe that's the reason they, they didn't, um, come to school for a few days. Yet nobody could define that as an emergency that, that demands entrance. Um, many of us would say that that's a, a concern that demands that ACS go to people's houses and say, can we help you get Wi-Fi, right? Um, but so I think that, that there are clear examples on both sides. There's going to be some muddy area, and that will have to be worked out in, you know, through ACS developing policies. Hopefully they would do that hearing directly from parents affected. I mean, they have started to acknowledge that it doesn't make sense for them to develop any policies without hearing from the people who are gonna be impacted. But I think that's something that would have to develop over time. Do you wanna add in or? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, echoing what Steph said, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us and for giving us this experience of listening to you. Um, 
at the beginning of the panel, you talked about the low bar that's required to trigger an investigation. Like basically what it takes, it seems, is a call from a mandated reporter. And I was just thinking about the different forms that this mandated reporter can take. Like it can be a hospital employee. I think like also like school systems can feed into this. So basically like so many different types of people can be a mandated reporter, it seems. And so I was wondering how you think this feeds into the sort of the expansion of the family policing system that you were talking about. And I was also wondering if you had any ideas about how we can imagine a system that sort of steps away from that expansion or mitigates it. Well, mandated reporting is an issue that we have been trying to fix, but the problem with um, mandated reporting or trying to eliminate how many folks are mandated reporters is that children are the best victims and like, we're not the best victims, I shouldn't say that, but like when, when people think about children and victimization, it's like, people don't wanna be on the side of, oh, I, I didn't protect the children. And so lawmakers don't wanna be the people to say that I wasn't the one to help protect the children by enforcing mandated reporting or supporting mandated reporting. And so it's gonna be a heavy lift to shrink the system um, from how large it is now to something that we want to see in the future. What we wanna see in the future is the system being abolished. Like that's, that's the main goal. But right now it's like we're doing work towards, well, before folks were doing work to reform the system, but it wasn't reforming the system. It was actually making the system stronger. And now folks have realized that we have to do work in another direction, in the direction of abolition. And so that work looks like um, dismantling some of the policies that are happening now, like the mandated reporting and uh, the, um, the Miranda rights. And so, What's happening is folks are jumping on the train to abolition. There are more folks that are in support of abolition than there are folks that are in support of the system. I think that people will need to learn more about what's happening, like what, what it means to be a mandated reporter and like understand. I think there needs to be more training around what it means to be a mandated reporter. And like there shouldn't, it shouldn't be just mandated reporting. And if like you see that there's a problem, you should try to fix the problem if it's in your power to fix it. Um, so instead of mandated reporting, I think it should be mandated supporting. Like if, a, if you see that a child is they don't have the resources that they need. Instead of removing that child from the home, you should try to get that child or that family the resources that they need. And oftentimes that's not what's happening. It's like, well, we're just gonna remove the child from the home and the system or the, the ACS or the Office of Children and Family Services is somehow gonna give this child what they need now. And it makes the problems worse. And so people need to, there needs to be different training around what it means to be a mandated reporter. And I think that will help to shrink um, the current family policing system or the way that families are put into the system, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I'll just add, I mean, I, I think your question actually suggests the answer that we really need to move toward narrowing the entryway and away from this, this notion that is driven uh, family regulation policy for the last several de decades, which is an idea of err on the side of caution, be over-inclusive. And of course, what that misses is the idea that there are harms to the intervention. Um, uh, and, you know, family separation being the, the most extreme harm. Um, but 
you know, the, the invasion of your home and, and the surveillance um, and the child's experience, often for the first time, um, that, that their parent is not in charge and that, and that um, you know, figures of authority are disrespecting their parent um, and threatening the parent-child relationship. I mean, that, that, is a, that is a significant harm to children to have that realization. Um, and, you know, how do we do that? How do we move away from that notion? You know, I, I think partly is just as, as basic as, as starting to, to think about all families as families that we value. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, imagining to stop the us, them, you know, it, it's, you know, all of us understand the value of a family. And if we really put that at the floor, that's what's going to change um, the impulse to, uh, to be punitive, to surveil um, uh, rather than support or rather than just to leave alone, which is really what a lot of families uh, need. Um, and I'll, I'll just add that, you know, Shrinking the mandated reporter group is one way to do that. Um, so the federal laws incentivize having mandated reporters, but New York State could narrow who counts as a mandated reporter. And most of the calls, as, as you suggested, are mandated reporters, teachers, and others. Um, but then there are a lot of non-mandated reporters, and New York even allows anonymous reporting. There is another piece of legislation that parent activists have um, proposed that would do away with anonymous reporting. You could still call confidentially and not have your name shared with somebody. But you don't have to spend too much time on the internet to know that if you if you allow something to be anonymous, you're, you're bringing out the worst in people um, and you are allowing people to abuse the system um, and make every, it, it, a person can make as many anonymous calls as far from you know reality in terms of the allegations as they want. And children's services will do that 60 and day investigation every single time. And we're just allowing that to happen. And, and the, you know, those are, those are immediate steps we could take to shrink it. Obviously, changing the larger ways we think about, you know, which, which families uh, are, do we care about, that, that's a longer term effort. Sarah, did you? Thank you so much um, to both, well, all four of you, actually. Um, I have two questions, so feel free to disregard one or both or whatever you want to answer. But um, my first question is, if you would be able to speak to the interaction of ACS and survivors of domestic violence, um, having worked with survivors, I know that when survivors try to file uh, family offense petitions, oftentimes there is a concern of ACS getting involved and kind of how that interplays. And if you see there, uh, if you see that there might be an opportunity to create like an immunity in that space, for survivors against ACS, it create a I just didn't hear kind you. of like a space of immunity mm -hmm. for survivors in that space. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second question is, I see a lot of parallels between ACS and ICE, and I'm wondering kind of if you see there to be an opportunity in terms of know your rights campaigns in the same way for ACS as as is done for immigrant communities. Oh. There are parallels between ICE and ACS. There, like we we talk about that a lot at Rise, uh, where I work. Um, we we're actually organizing, we're working to organize around the family policing system and thinking about um, what, who do we need to collaborate with, who do we need to co-conspire with, and we have been talking about like talking to immigrant communities and um, immigrant folks that are organizing for immigration and folks that are organizing for domestic violence, um, folks that are organizing for um, criminal justice or like the abolition of jails and prisons. Um, because it's all, all of, all of these things are connected in ways that it's, it's, it's crazy that we haven't dismantled it yet it, it, because of the ways that everything is connected. Um, I think it would be a good idea to do the same Know Your Rights campaign for um, folks that are experiencing ACS investigations as they do in immigrant communities. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the rest of your question. 
Um, that, I mean, I think you addressed both in the same way. The first was just about whether you envision there to be the opportunity for survivors to have immunity in family court against ACS investigations when filing for orders of protection. I think they should have immunity, um, but I don't, that's, I think that they should have immunity, but I don't think that it's going to happen anytime soon because of the way that things are, the way, the ways in which things are still connected. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's going to be a heavy lift, I think. I mean, I, I, I think on that, that I, I, I agree about the political viability of, mm -hmm. of, of immunity, but, but maybe a, um, a more effective way to think about it is I, I don't want to give domestic violence victims immunity. I want the system to be a system that I would be comfortable mm -hmm. interacting with anybody, domestic violence victims or, or otherwise. That is, um, it shouldn't be a negative experience. And if there isn't enough to justify an invasive uh, investigation for a domestic violence victim, as I is very often the, the case, I, I think most often the case in the situations you're talking about, there shouldn't be one, just like there shouldn't be for somebody else. So I do think that survivors of domestic violence have played a really critical role in, in calling out um, the problems of family regulation um, and showing how it's, it's often doing exactly the opposite of what it says it, it, it's intended to do. Uh, domestic violence survivors have been uh, very much at the forefront of this call for to ban the anonymous reporting because, of course, it, 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 you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that if, if somebody is experiencing domestic violence, um, the perpetrator of that violence just has a new tool. If they can pick up the phone uh, and wreak havoc in that person's I mean, there can be an order of protection preventing somebody from contacting a former partner. Um, and it's still completely legal for them to call and make an anonymous report again and again and, and turn that, that family's life upside down. So uh, to me, it's about taking the broader lessons from, from survivors of domestic violence um, that, you know, that a carceral approach just doesn't doesn't benefit the people we say we're, we're trying to benefit. Uh, on, the, on the connection to immigration, I, I certainly agree. It's, it's, you know, these, these systems are, you know, reflect and reinforce each other. Um, it was very striking to those of us in the family regulation field that when, you know, the Trump administration started separating uh, families at the border, every single person I know had just a visceral, you know, kick in the stomach response. How that is out, an outrageous thing to do. Um, and, you know, that was, it was encouraging to see that response. And yet it, it was also so frustrating. Why don't you care about the, the, the family separations that we're doing every day inside the borders? And so, you know, to bring no, the, the sense of outrage we feel in, in one situation to another, um, and you know, and that's where the work is. And I, it's the work for you, all, you all, this this generation of, um, even in circles of people who are politically um, aware, who are motivated to really address things. I, there aren't very. I don't think there are very many, you know, dinner parties in the United States anymore where there isn't some awareness uh, of the immigration issue. We might disagree about it, but people are thinking about criminal justice. There's no room in the United States where people don't know there's work to be done in criminal justice, and they just don't know it about family regulation. And we we have to take that message out there um, that these families deserve just as much of our uh, attention. Thank you both. I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has a question. You can also ask yeah, I, I was just yeah. I, I definitely have a question. So <laughs> I'm curious, I mean, working in this system for three years, I've seen how um, ACS caseworkers really just do whatever they want. So I'm curious um, what you both think about how, if these bills are passed, how this can be administered properly, what you think that training needs to look like for parents, for this to actually be a reality, even if it is legislation. Um, <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's always the most challenging question is, you know, we, <laughs> Many of us have a you know a sense of what we want written down and and how to how to make it real is is of course the hard part. 
Um, I guess I'll, I'll say a couple things about that. So first of all, you know, we call this Miranda legislation because we wanted to pick up on the, you know, very widespread sense that in the criminal justice context, you have these Miranda rights. We all know them from, you know, NYPD Blue or, 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 or other uh, TV shows, right? Um, and but of course, the, the the case Miranda versus Arizona that gave us those rights is is not available in our world because the Fifth Amendment applies to criminal cases and not civil cases. And so because of that, we're never going to have the enforcement mechanisms that there are on the criminal side. Again, I don't want to suggest that the criminal side is where it needs to be, but it, it is further along and, and, and there are more clear constitutional rights established by the Supreme Court that aren't, um, they're not available in the same way. We're not going to have the remedy that we have on the criminal side, which is that if the police violate your rights, then that evidence that they obtain is excluded from the prosecution. That's not an available remedy on our side in, in, in because family cases are, are civil cases. So that that's what makes um, Caitlin's question so critical about, so how do we make them do what they're legally supposed to do? So there are there is a legal remedy, which is suing after the fact and getting monetary damages. Um, and I and I do expect that will have to happen to to make the Miranda rights real. Um, we did try to um, we we tried to make that easier or at least set up a way to assess what's going on by requiring in the bill that they not only tell you your rights but document that they have done so. So if they haven't documented it, it didn't happen. Now we all know documentation doesn't isn't necessarily accurate, but that's a small step on the way to the accountability. Um, but there's, you know, there's the account, the, the external accountability that I think lawyers in particular play a really big role in, and we need you for that. Um, and then there's the, you know, the, the proactive, what should the agency be doing? Um, and of course, they should be training both, don't do it because you're going to get in trouble, but also don't do it because it's not right. And that's not what our mission is. And that's not how you should be treating people. Um, as you go about this. And, and that's just a, you know, again, a, a longer haul. I think that training has to be, it, it has to be shaped by the input of, I mean, one of the things that's so impressive about RISE as an organization um, is that they both educate the public, but also, um, you know, go to the administrators and say, you, you need us, you know, you need to hear from us as you're developing these things. And I think for trainings on something like this, that couldn't be more crucial. And I just want to uplift the uh, hit them in their pockets. It's like the suing for, you know, to get any type of monies or something after the fact. It's like people don't understand the impact of their actions until you hit them in their pocket. It's like when you <laughs> touch people's money, they, they start to understand differently than when you don't. So yeah, I just wanted to uplift that one. Please join us. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I was gonna say, well, because Caitlin really did all it really shouldn't be like for us. Um, to Caitlin uh, and Chris and Halima for this wonderful discussion. Now there are the box lunches. Um